Chapter 14, Ender's Teacher Took your time, didn't you, Graf? The voyage isn't short, but the three-month vacation seems excessive. I prefer not to deliver damaged merchandise. Some men simply have no sense of hurry. Oh, well. It's only the fate of the world. Never mind me. You must understand our anxiety. We're here with the Ansible, receiving constant reports of the progress of our starships. We have to face the upcoming war every day, if you can call them days. He's such a very little boy. There's a greatness in him, a magnitude of spirit. A killer instinct too, I hope. Yes. We've planned out an impromptu course of study for him. All subject to your approval, of course. I'll look at it. I don't pretend to know the subject matter, Admiral Chamran Jagar. I'm only here because I know Ender. So don't be afraid that I'll try to second-guess the order of your presentation. Only the pace. How much can we tell him? Don't waste his time on the physics of interstellar travel. What about the Ensible? I already told him about that. And the fleets. I said they would arrive at their destination within five years. It seems there's very little left for us to tell him. You can tell him about the weapon systems. He has to know enough to make intelligent decisions. Ah, we can't be useful after all. How very kind. We've devoted one of the five simulators to his excess exclusive use. What about the others? The other simulators? The other children. You were brought here to take care of Ender Wigan. Just curious. Remember, they were all my students at one time or another. And now they are mine. They are entering into the mysteries of the fleet, Colonel Graf, to which you, as a soldier, have never been introduced. You make it sound like a priesthood, and a god, and a religion. Even those of us who command by Ansible know the majesty of flight among the stars. I can see you'll find my mysticism distasteful. I assure you that uh, your distaste only reveals your ignorance. Soon enough, Ender Wigan will also know what I know. He will dance the graceful ghost dance through the stars, and whatever greatness there is within him will be unlocked, revealed, set forth before the universe for all to see. You have the soul of a stone, Colonel Graf, but I sing to a stone as easily as to another singer. You may go to your quarters and establish yourself. I have nothing to establish except the clothing I'm wearing. You own nothing? They keep my salary in an account somewhere on Earth. I've never needed it. Except to buy civilian clothes on my... vacation. A non-materialist. And yet you are unpleasantly fat. A glutinous ascetic? Such a contradiction. When I'm tense, I eat. Whereas when you're tense, you spout solid waste. I like you, Colonel Graf. I think we shall get along. I don't much care, Admiral Chamran Jagar. I came here for Ender, and neither of us came here for you. Ender hated Eros from the moment he shuttled down from the tug. He had been uncomfortable enough on Earth, where floors were flat. Eros was hopeless. It was a roughly spindle-shaped rock, only six and a half kilometers thick at its narrowest point. Since the surface of the planetoid was entirely devoted to absorbing sunlight and converting it to energy, everyone lived in the smooth-walled rooms linked by tunnels that laced the interior of the asteroid. The closed-in space was no problem for Ender. What bothered him was that all the tunnel floors noticeably sloped downward. From the start, Ender was plagued by vertigo as he walked through the tunnels, especially the ones that girdled Eros's narrow circumference. It did not help that gravity was only half of Earth normal, the illusion of being on the verge of falling was almost complete. There was also something disturbing about the proportions of the rooms. The ceilings were too low for the width, the tunnels too narrow. It was not a comfortable place. Worst of all, though, was the number of people. Ender had no important memories of the scale of the cities of Earth. His idea of a comfortable number of people was the battle school, where he had known by sight every person who dwelt there. Here, though, 10,000 people lived within the rock. There was no crowding, despite the amount of space devoted to life support and other machinery. What bothered Ender was that he was constantly surrounded by strangers. They never let him out to know anyone. He saw the other command school students often, but since he never attended any class regularly, they remained only faces. 
He would attend a lecture here or there, but usually he was tutored by one teacher after another, or occasionally helped to learn a process by another student, whom he met once and never saw again. He ate alone or with Colonel Graff. His recreation was in a gym, but he rarely saw the same people in it twice. He recognized that they were isolating him again, this time not by setting the other students to hating him, but rather by giving them no opportunity to become friends. He could hardly have been close to most of them anyway, except for Ender, the other students were all well into adolescence. So Ender withdrew into his studies and learned quickly and well. Astrogation and military history he absorbed like water. Abstract mathematics was more difficult, but whenever he was given a problem that involved patterns in space and time, he found that his intuition was more reliable than his calculation. He often saw at once a solution that he could only prove after minutes or hours of manipulating numbers. And for pleasure, there was the simulator, the most perfect video game he had ever played. Teachers and students trained him, step by step, in its use. At first, not knowing the awesome power of the game, he had played only the tactical level, controlling a single fighter in continuous maneuvers to find and destroy an enemy. The computer-controlled enemy was devious and powerful, and whenever Ender tried a tactic, he found the computer used it against him within minutes. The game was a holographic display, and his fighter was represented only by a tiny light. The enemy was another light of a different color, and they danced and spun and maneuvered through a cube of space that must have been ten meters to a side. The controls were powerful. He could rotate the display in any direction, so he could watch from any angle, and he could move the center so that the duel took place nearer or farther from him. Gradually, as he became more adept at controlling the fighter's speed, direction of movement, orientation, and weapons, the game was made more complex. He might have two enemy ships at once, and there might be obstacles, the debris of space, he began to have to worry about fuel and limited weapons. The computer began to assign him particular things to destroy or accomplish so that he had to avoid distractions and achieve an objective in order to win. When he had mastered the one fighter game, they allowed him to step back into the four fighter squadron. He spoke commands to simulated pilots of four fighters, and instead of merely carrying out the computer's instructions, he was allowed to determine tactics himself, deciding which of several objectives was the most valuable and directing his squadron accordingly. At any time, he could take personal command of one of the fighters for a short time, and at first he did this often. When he did, however, the other three fighters in his squadron were soon destroyed, and as the games became harder and harder, he had to spend more and more of his time commanding the squadron. When he did, he won more and more often. By the time he had been at command school for a year, he was adept at running the simulator at any of 15 levels, from controlling an individual fighter to commanding a fleet. He had long since realized that as the battle school was to battle school, as the battle room was to battle school, so the simulator was to command school. The classes were valuable, but the real education was the game. People dropped in from time to time to watch him play. They never spoke, hardly anyone ever did, unless they had something specific to teach him. The watchers would stay, silently, watching him through a difficult simulation, and then leave just as he finished. What are you doing? He wanted to ask. Judging me? Determining whether you want to trust the fleet to me? Just remember that I didn't ask for it. He found that a great deal of what he learned at battle school transferred to the simulator. He would routinely reorient the simulator every few minutes, rotating it so that he didn't get trapped into an up-down orientation, constantly reviewing his position from the enemy point of view. It was exhilarating at last to have such control over the battle, to be able to see every point of it. It was also frustrating to have so little control, too, for the computer-controlled fighters were only as good as the computer allowed. They took no initiative. They had no intelligence. He began to wish for his tune leaders so that he could count on some of the squadrons doing well without having his constant supervision. At the end of his first year, he was winning every battle on the simulator and played the game as if the machine were a natural part of his body. One day, eating a meal with Graf, he asked, Is that all the simulator does? is what all. The way it plays now, it's easy, and it hasn't got any harder for a while. Oh. Graf seemed unconcerned, but then Graf always seemed unconcerned. The next day, everything changed. Graf went away, and in his place, they gave Ender a companion. He was in the room when Ender awoke in the morning. He was an old man, sitting cross-legged on the floor, 
Ender looked at him expectantly, waiting for the man to speak. He said nothing. Ender got up and showered and dressed, content to let the man keep his silence if he wanted. He had long since learned that when something unusual was going on, something that was part of someone else's plan and not his own, he would find out more information by waiting than by asking. Adults almost always lost their patience before Ender did. The man still hadn't spoken when Ender was ready and went to the door to leave the room. The door didn't open. Ender turned to face the man sitting on the floor. He looked to be about 60, by far the oldest man Ender had seen on Eros. He had a day's growth of white whiskers that grizzled his face only slightly less than his close-cut hair. His face sagged a little and his eyes were surrounded by creases and lines. He looked at Ender with an expression that bespoke only apathy. Ender turned back to the door and tried again to open it. All right, he said, giving up. Why is the door locked? The old man continued to look at him blankly. So this is a game, thought Ender. Well, if they want me to go to class, they'll unlock the door. If they don't, they won't. I don't care. Ender didn't like games where the rules could be anything and the objective was known to them alone. So he wouldn't play. He also refused to get angry. He went through a relaxing exercise as he leaned on the door and soon he was calm again. The old man continued to watch him impassively. It seemed to go on for hours, Ender refusing to speak, the old man seeming to be a mindless mute. Sometimes Ender wondered if he were mentally ill, escaped from some medical ward somewhere in Eros, living out some insane fantasy here in Ender's room. But the longer it went on with no one coming to the door, no one looking for him, the more certain he became that this was something deliberate meant to disconcert him. Ender did not want to give the old man the victory. To pass the time, he began to do exercises. Some were impossible without the gym equipment, but others, especially from his personal defense class, he could do without any aids. The exercises moved him around the room. He was practicing lunges and kicks. One move took him near the old man, as he had come near him before, but this time the old man shot out and seized Ender's left leg in the middle of a kick. It pulled Ender off his feet and landed him heavily on the floor. Ender leapt to his feet, immediately furious. He found the old man sitting calmly, cross-legged, not breathing heavily, as if he had never moved. Ender stood, poised to fight, but the other's immobility made it impossible for Ender to attack. What? Kick the old man's head off? And then explain it to Graf? Oh, the old man kicked me, and I had to get even. He went back to his exercises. The old man kept watching. Finally tired and angry at this wasted day, a prisoner in his room, Ender went back to his bed to get his desk. As he leaned over to pick up the desk, he felt a hand jab roughly between his thighs and another hand grab his hair. In a moment, he had been turned upside down. His face and shoulders were being pressed into the floor by the old man's knee while his back was excruciatingly bent and his legs were pinioned by the old man's arm. Ender was helpless to use his arms. He couldn't bend his back to gain slack so he could use his legs. In less than two seconds, the old man had completely defeated Ender Wigan. All right! Ender gasped, you win. The old man's knee thrust painfully downward. Since when? Asked the man, his voice soft and rasping. Do you have to tell the enemy when he has won? Ender remained silent. I surprised you once, Ender Wigan. Why didn't you destroy me immediately afterward? Just because I looked peaceful? You turned your back on me. Stupid. You have learned nothing. You have never had a teacher. Ender was angry now and made no attempt to control or conceal it. I've had too many teachers. How was I supposed to know you'd turn out to be a, an enemy, Ender Wigan? Whispered the old man. I am your enemy. The first one you've ever had who was smarter than you. There is no teacher but the enemy. No one but the enemy will tell you what the enemy is going to do. No one but the enemy will ever teach you how to destroy and conquer. Only the enemy shows you where you are weak. Only the enemy tells you where you are strong. And the rules of the game are what you do can do to him and what you can stop him from doing to you. I am your enemy from now on. From now on, I am your teacher. Then the old man let Ender's legs fall. Because he still held Ender's head to the floor, 
The boy couldn't use his arms to compensate, and his legs hit the surface with a loud crack and a sickening pain. Then the old man stood and let Ender rise. Slowly, Ender pulled his legs under him, with a faint groan of pain. He knelt on all fours for a moment, recovering. Then his right arm flashed out, reaching for his enemy. The old man quickly danced back, and Ender's hand closed on air as his teacher's foot shot forward to catch Ender on the chin. Ender's chin wasn't there. He was lying flat on his back, spinning on the floor, and during the moment that his teacher was off balance from his kick, Ender's feet smashed into the old man's other leg. He fell in a heap, but close enough to strike out and hit Ender in the face. Ender couldn't find an arm or a leg that held strong, still long enough to be grabbed, and in the meantime, blows were landing on his back and arms. Ender was smaller. He couldn't reach past the old man's flailing limbs. Finally, he managed to pull away and scramble back near the door. The old man was sitting cross-legged again, but now the apathy was gone. He was smiling. Better this time, boy, but slow. You will have to be better with a fleet than you are with your body, or no one will be safe with you in command. Lesson learned. Ender nodded slowly. He ached in a hundred places. Good, said the old man. Then we'll never have to have such a battle again. All the rest with the simulator. I will program your battles now, not the computer. I will devise the strategy of your enemy and you will learn to be quick and discover what tricks the enemy has for you. Remember, boy, from now on the enemy is more clever than you. From now on the enemy is stronger than you. From now on you are always about to lose. The old man's face grew serious again. You will be about to lose, Ender, but you will win. You will learn to defeat the enemy. He will teach you how. The teacher got up. In this school, it was always been the practice for a young student to be chosen by an older student. The two become companions, and the older boy teaches the younger one everything he knows. Always they fight, always they compete, always they are together. I have chosen you. Ender spoke as the old man walked to the door. You're too old to be a student. One is never too old to be a student of the enemy. I have learned from the buggers. You will learn from me. As the old man palmed the door open, Ender leaped into the air and kicked him in the small of the back with both feet. He hit hard enough that he rebounded onto his feet as the old man cried out and collapsed on the floor. The old man got up slowly, holding onto the door handle, his face contorted with pain. He seemed disabled, but Ender didn't trust him. Yet in spite of his suspicion, he was caught off guard by the old man's speed. In a moment, he found himself on the floor near the opposite wall, his nose and lip bleeding where his face had hit the bed. He was able to turn enough to see the old man standing in the doorway, wincing and holding his back. The old man grinned. Ender grinned back. Teacher, he said, do you have a name? Mazer Rackham, said the old man. Then he was gone. <laughs>